Have you ever known what it feels like to have to leave the home you lived in your whole life and knowingly doom your entire history? The Visigothic Kingdom, the Umayyad Caliphate, the Iberian Emirate, and then the Cordoban Caliphate. The Taifish, the Almoravids, and the Almohads. This video will be a rather emotional one, not just because it's the end of the Reconquista series and our time talking about a bunch of dust and fossils, but also, ah, boy, this, this hurt to say. I can't say a North African score anymore. Oh well. I guess I'll just have to go back to banging your parents after this video. It's a real big shame. But anyways, the Emirate of Granada rose during the chaotic Third Taifa era, when the Almohads abandoned the Iberian Peninsula in order to solidify their holdings in North Africa. So Muhammad Yusuf ibn uh, Nasr was the Emirate's first king, and the kingdom itself was founded in 1232. But just 18 years later, Granada found itself completely surrounded by a much stronger and hostile Catholic kingdom, that of Castillo. Now, there's a lot to talk about here, and a lot of genuine cultural achievements that the kingdom of Granada had from its uh, general tolerance of uh, Catholics, yay, to their tolerance of uh, Jews, yuck, and also its architectural achievements, such as the construction of the Alhambra. This video is about the fall of Granada and what happened afterwards, what happened to the conquerors and the conquered, but I'm still going to talk about Granadan society. So, if you wanted solely a dramatic retelling of the fall of Granada, well then kill yourself. <laughs> Given Granada's location at the very south of the peninsula, this meant that they were the furthest taifa from the Catholic frontier, and they also got all of the Muslim refugees from all the other conquered taifas. Now, we don't know the population count of the country exactly, but these waves of uh, refugees made the very small kingdom's population increase substantially, up to maybe 300,000, with uh, the capital city having about 50,000 people. The population was also by this time made up of uh, majority Muslims, as unlike during the old years of the Umayyad Caliphate of Iberia, the Iberian population under their control had been completely assimilated. Arab was the pre predominant language. And while, yes, Catholics were tolerated and the Jews given a protected uh, status, the majority religion was Muslim. They had an economy built mostly off of agriculture and the trade of high value goods. The kingdom itself was also a vital center of Arab culture. Uh, for example, uh, important philosophers such as Ibn Khaldun and Ibn al Khatib, I apologize, serving in the Nazarite court. Poetry also meant a ton to the Granadan elites, and a lot of the Emirates kings were scholars themselves. Dozens of castles also dotted uh, the land, which were manned by soldiers constant constantly watching for either Catholic incursions or Moroccan incursions. Well, our story begins, like with so many others, with the death of a great king, Muhammad V. Muhammad was born around 1339. He was the eldest child of the Sultan Yusuf I. Yusuf's legacy is one of glory. I won't go into the details, because again, this video isn't about him, so instead, I'll focus more on his death. He was assassinated while praying in a mosque. He was 36 at the time, and the killer was apparently an insane slave. Muhammad's reign is important to know, 
because he was the last king to rule over Granada at its height. Muhammad was 16 at the time of his rise, and his rule lasted for 37 interrupted years. And what do I mean by that? Well, in 1359, a plot came to fruition, which resulted in Muhammad being ousted and replaced by his stepbrother, who I can only assume constantly helped free Muhammad's sister from the many vile washers in this suspiciously well lit room. Muhammad reclaimed the throne in 1362 with the help of the King of Castile, who would promptly execute Stepro for the awful, awful crime of not being Johnny Sins, and he let Muhammad V take back his throne. What followed was three decades of a Muslim emirate that, uh, despite its small size and vassal status to Castile, used shrewd diplomacy for its own benefit. Muhammad used the Castilian civil war to his benefit, recapturing some amounts of territory to his kingdom, such as Algeciras, and he would fight on both sides of uh, the Castilian civil war spurring chaos in his stronger overlord. Internally, he faced nearly no issues in his second reign, and he used his time to build many palaces, such as the Palace of the Lions, or rebuild old Sekhmusenj in his residences, and he even refurbished the Court of the Myrtles, which is just about the most adorable grandma name I've ever seen. But the Court of your grandma was essentially the center part of the Kumaras castle. Muhammad also centralized power, placing the army directly under him, and he built a hospital for his people, which is known as the Maristan of Granada. This hospital was one of the first in Europe to include care for the mental ill. And then we had the biggest plot to us ever. Muhammad V died of being old. Oh, but don't worry, his descendants were able to share power amongst each other and rule just as well. Uh, su succession disputes, civil wars, assassination, scheming, you fucking name it. Even war with Castile breaking out again. And uh, with Muhammad uh, V's old body in Spain being long dead and long assassinated, the new rulers in Spain were not so keen on having that, uh, that little stain on the Iberian map as Islamic territory. So this chaos came to a head at the final capture of Gibraltar by the Castilians. According to Wikipedia and other sources, it was the eighth siege of Gibraltar. The area was of vital importance to Granada as it was the main point where they could receive help from the African continent, and it also served as a great staging ground for Islamic raids into Castilian territory. The siege was led by the Duke Juan de Guzman, Alonso de Arcus and Rodrigo de Arcus, better known as Ponce de Rion. The men led their troops to fight the weakened Moorish garrison. The battle was fierce, but they lost and had to withdraw. In their camp, they were arguing and planning their next move. When? Hey, hey, dickwads. What, what do you want? Can't you see we're busy planning how to commit a genocide here? I'm, yeah, I could tell. And you're doing a shit job at it. Listen, how about a deal? You let us go with all of our stuff and you get to keep the town. How about that? Wait, are you serious? Yeah, I'm, I've got a cramp on my lap for sitting on it all day and my friend Jim just got with the, the blacksmith's daughter when you guys, you asswipes, showed up. So will, will you let us go? Uh, all right, yeah, sure. The Granada garrison, after this deal, they, they just up and left and the, the siege, siege, ended without any real fighting or struggle in 1462, less than a year after it had started. The soldiers in, in question, well, they abandoned their posts and uh, they scattered into the countryside. 
I mean, why would these soldiers just so brazenly do such a thing? Well, the central government, uh, it was kind of a shit heap. So if your boss can figure out what the fuck he's doing, are you really going to risk getting stabbed with a spear? Just think about it. But uh, the chaos and civil wars continued uh, intermittently all the way to February of 1482, when Spain came to end the Emirates existence. In 1474, something big happened in, Cast in Castile. Instead of rising to the kitchen, a woman rose to the throne. Queen Isabella, who was married to the King of Aragon, so for the first time 80% of the peninsula was united against the Moors to the south. And after some internal civil wars, the two rulers turned their full attention to the southern Islamic kingdom. There was no way, no damn way that Granada could ever hope to stand up to a united Spain with infinitely more manpower, resources, more of everything. But that's what they did. By 1482, Granada's borders had shrunk substantially in its inception. As it turns out, the Gibraltar affair was not the only one, as many other assaults and conquests had taken place throughout the kingdom. According to Michael Berry in his book, by the end of 1481, Granada's borders comprised less than three quarters of the area of the early years of the Nazarite dynasty. The frontier now ran from just west of Estepona, looping inland to the north of Ronda, then south of Antequera, this being north of Granada and onwards to the east, around Huescar into the coast east of Mujacar. At this time, both Granada and Castile had a truce, but we can easily see that both sides had been practically ignoring it. Again, uh, Granada's shrinking territory and even a brief reconquest by the Moors of uh, the town of Zahara in the end of 1481. This attack, however, was the casus belli that the Spanish needed for their war. The Moors had purged Zahara completely and enslaved many of the townsfolk there. Now, let me tell you, I don't know how war crimes work anymore, I mean not since Nam anyways, but I do know that if your enemy commits them, then that means the war is over and now you're in a competition for biggest war crime. The Spanish responded by taking Alhama de Granada in February of 1482, something which many people nowadays consider the formal start to the Granada War. And this conquest was not good, like, it was really bad, as the area the Spanish took was literally 40 kilometers away from the capital. Alhama was a vital area for the Emirate. As yes, it was literally splitting distance from the city of Granada, but it also controlled the main route to other areas of the kingdom, such as the route to Malga. Granada was in no real shape to respond. Castile and Aragon, or Spain I guess, moved on to try and take Roja, but failed and were repelled. However, Granada's great unity and faith in their soul reader showed through, and um, the Muslim king's son rebelled and declared himself as the Emir. Now from here until the end of the war, the Emirate was ruled by three different kings or Emirs. We have Abu Hassan, also known as Murray Hassan, Muhammad XII, also known as Boabdil, and Muhammad XIII also known as Al Zaghal. I will be using all of these names interchangeably, so please remember their names. There will be a test at the end. No, I won't tell you what's on the test, are you fucking stupid? Al Zaghal, the brother to Murray Hassan, 
had defeated a large Christian force. But Boabdil, uh, who was the king, got captured. And this capture changed the war entirely. Granada was in the midst of a uh, civil war, as Boabdil's father, Abu Hassan, was evicted from power. But he was still in the country. He had uh, set up shop around the east of the country, where he had been raiding Catholics. And with Boabdil's capture, Mr. Hassan was able to return to power. And Fernand, the, the king of Aragon, seeing his chance to completely conquer Granada, freed Boabdil and sent him home. Uh, he would then establish himself in Guadix. So the civil war in Granada ramped up, while the, the Castilians began steadily pushing into Granada. This with uh, the help of some very cool cannons. Murray Hassan, however, was an old man. Yes, somehow older than Biden, if you can believe it. And he was reportedly getting in incapacitated by epilepsy. So, Al Zagal stepped up. That's right, his own brother. Zagal was able uh, to capture a Boabdil stronghold, capturing it around the beginning of 1485, while Castillo itself captured Coin and Cartama. Yes, Coin is a real place. I had to look it up. I guess the Spanish are real big on money. But the terrified aid populace of those two towns fled eastwards. And while they were doing that, some big events were happening in the city of Granada itself. Murray Hassan, uh, being a sick old bag of bones, was forced out of power, and Al Zaghar came to power. Apparently, just a few months later, Murray died. And despite some minor victories by the now King Al Zaghar at uh, Mokrin, the Spanish advance continued, and there was no way to stop it. Boabdil, however, knew that the people were tired of war, and he found his way to capitalize on that feeling, promising peace and, and the end to the war if he was brought back on the throne. His efforts did work. An uprising began in the capital, but thanks to some liberal usage of uh, artillery by Zagao's troops, the uprising eventually died down. This was also helped by the fact that uh, Boabdil and Zagao made up and they were BFFs again. So at least for a bit, the war had ended and Granada now was actually united against Spain. And uh, oh yeah, uh, there's a war going on, so how's that going for them? Bad. That's how it's going. It's going bad. Raja was, con was conquered with uh, the use of cannons by the Spanish. Uh, and Raja is uh, where Boabdil had been stationed under orders by Zakal. And um, you guessed it, Boabdil was captured again. And not only that, he turned sides again, signing a new deal with uh, the Spanish. However, this deal was different than before. He was recognized as the ruler of Granada, but he, he had to become the permanent vassal of Spain and also support the Catholic Kingdom in all, all their efforts. A three-year truce would also be given to every town which supported Boabdil, and with that, the Granada Civil War was on. Again. Uh, Boabdil began his rebellion in uh, Albaicin and Al Zaghal moved to face him, but immediately he heard of a Spanish army moving towards Malaga. Zaghal faced a difficult choice. Turn around and face the Spanish who were definitely only attacking to divert his attention or attack Boabdil, who wants the throne. Zaghal made the best decision he could, which also didn't work. He split his forces leading half of them to Malga and the other half uh, stayed at their position to stop Boabdil's rebellion. Malga was the second biggest city and of huge importance to the war effort. With Gibraltar gone, Malga was the best way for Granada 
to receive reinforcements from North Africa. And it also housed the Granadan fleet. The siege lasted for four months. And uh, oh yeah, uh, a little bit of a fun fact. It was the first battle where ambulances were used, but they, they were not, you know, actual cars. They were probably just wagons. The siege lasted for four months. In befitting the city's importance to the Kingdom of Granada, Malaga had a ton of well-maintained defenses. Malaga itself was insanely rich when compared to other places in Granada. Vineyards were located in the city, along with orchards for pomegranates, olives and oranges. And the city itself was dotted with elegant architecture, built during the Cordoban Caliphate era. And beyond that, the garrison was very well equipped, possessing a bunch of artillery and even a, uh, a small corps of African mercenaries and volunteers from recently conquered towns. Malaga's defenses were commanded by a man named Hamet el Zegri, while King Fernando of Aragon led the siege. The Spanish road to Malaga was a dangerous one. The country wasn't exactly suited for these big armies with, with big siege engines, so the army would have to travel in groups, with uh, the first half taking the small siege engines and the other bringing in the heavy guns. On the 7th of May, 1487, the army arrived at Malga and then circled the town, after having to fight off a fierce Moorish garrison from their location. So Fernando had the city locked down, while a fleet of Spanish ships had sailed across the strait and sealed the city from the sea. Sometime later, fierce fighting for the uh, city had pushed the Moors inside the city walls, as repeated Christian assaults had pushed the Granadans into the walls, abandoning the city's suburbs to the Catholics. However, the suburbs were the easy part for Fernando, as walls manned by strong artillery with a bunch of ammunition proved really difficult to breach. It was due to that difficulty that Fernando may have intended uh, to starve the city out. But he soon changed his mind. He built siege towers, tried to dig under the walls, but all of this failed. Each attempt to breach the walls was met by an effective Moorish counterattack. They did get some success as they gained control of a small tower connected to the city wall. But by this time, that small victory did not matter. After three months of starvation, the population had completely ran out of food, to the point that uh, they had to resort to eating dogs, cats, or chewing on hides. Uh, Hammett did not see the point in continuing this struggle. How could he see the point in defending a kingdom that was on its last legs? A kingdom which had been seeing nothing but internal strife for nearly 100 years at that point. What Hammond realized in that siege is what I think hundreds of commanders slowly realized throughout the war, is that the age of our under Rouge was over and they needed to get the fuck out of there. With uh, not even Zaghal's forces managing to arrive in the city to help, because they were destroyed by Bob Dio's own forces, Hammond did the logical thing. He surrendered and withdrew his forces to a nearby fortress, uh, abandoning the city to uh, Fernand and Queen Isabella who had come to support the siege. For the population's strong defense of the city, the Muslim population was massacred, enslaved and their pop uh, property confiscated. Some of the slaves were taken to North Africa and freed there, while others were taken uh, to Spain to be given as gifts to other nobles. Out of the second largest uh, city in Granada, enslavement was the fate of 11,000 people. Death was the fate of the rest. And now Ma uh, Malga is done. And with that, the last Muslim holdouts are the capital, which is now controlled by Boabdil, Almeria, Baza, and Guadix. Guadix. These three are controlled by Zagal. 
Although, with this whole business, Bob Deal was feeling much more uncomfortable. He thought that he'd be able to govern over much of the Kingdom of Granada. But as the war dragged on, something was happening in towns and areas which were loyal to him. They were being administered by the Spanish after being attacked and conquered. This was something which, according to his deal, was not going to happen. So bear in mind that as we reach the end of the war, Boabdil is becoming increasingly aware that the Spanish have no intention of letting him rule, marching across the kingdom for themselves, not him. If he ever wanted to uh, make up with his uncle, he couldn't. As by the winter of uh, 1489, Alzaghal also saw that Granada was done and he surrendered to Spain. He got a nice lordship in exchange for his surrender. So now, Granada truly stood alone, and Boabdil is once again fighting for his Muslim people. Convinced on continuing the war, Boabdil sent an expedition southwards to try and establish a supply line to the sea. This while sending desperate pleas for help to the rest of the Muslim world. But none came, and no one listened. The Sultan of Morocco kept selling wheat to Spain uh, throughout the war, and the Mamluks in Egypt, desperate to fight off the Ottomans that Spain also fought, actively denied him help. The expedition to the sea would also be brought back to the, uh, to the capital, and finally, in early 1491, the siege of Granada began. The Spanish camp was built about 10 kilometers from the city itself, uh, and now has the name of Santa Fe, Holy Faith. With winter approaching, the city's sole supply line over the mountains would be closed by snow, and every fort in the outskirts of the city was eventually overrun and taken over by the Spanish. Over the 18th month long siege, hunger ran rampant and political scheming returned as corruption skyrocketed. Eventually, however, the Catholic monarchs summoned Boabdil to speak, to finally find some end to the brutal war. Welcome, Muhammad, and thank you for accepting our offer to join us here for the evening. Yeah, I got your damn messenger. What do you want? Well, quite simple. We want peace. We want you to stop your damn crusade or whatever you heathens call it. Uh, you mean a jihad? No thanks, I'm not in the mood. He means stop resisting, Muhammad. Um, how many more have got to die? How much worse will you let the hunger get? I saw Malaga. The children there were just skin and bone. I had one priest tell me that they saw one of the city's gardens there completely brown and near lifeless. You wanna know why? Why? Uh, the, cit the citizenry, in their hunger-induced madness, ate all the leaves from the trees. I saw it too. I mean really, Muhammad. All you had to do was take over and wait for us to stop your uncle's war. But then this? Come on. Well, what would you have me do? Surrender. End this. End all of it. Let the rivers flow water again and not blood. Surrender, I'd be marked as a coward with a horrible legacy. I'd be the coward whose legacy would be killing what remains of our Andalus. By God, Muhammad, look around you. Our Andalus died long before your parents were even born. Be proud your legacy will be that of a peacemaker, not a killer of a corpse. <laughs> Fine, let's end this. When a peace treaty was eventually signed, Boabdil got two months to implement it. Wanna know why? Well, because the government couldn't handle it. Literally, all the advisors which were left, um, all the stewards and governors, none, none of them could. The last government of our Andalus was one that even struggled to die. Catholic troops were sneaked into the Alhambra at night to make the surrender official. They, they did this to prevent the population from rising up in revolt.
So, on the first day of the year of 1492, Boabdil and his family left Alhambra for the final time. They greeted the Catholic monarchs at the gates of the city. Some sources suggest that the couple were wearing Muslim clothes when they met Boabdil. I kinda doubt it, but whatever. The peace deal itself was exceptionally generous to Boabdil and his subjects. Muslims were allowed plenty of time to leave Spain, and even if they stayed, they were allowed to keep up their religious practices. Basically, the Granadan Muslims were to be given a protected status within Spain. That didn't last, as uh, forced conversions began just a few years later, and even the Inquisition was brought to Granada. So the treaty, while generous, didn't last long, and the local Moors would wind up starting several failed rebellions. And uh, what of Boabdil? What happened to the man who surrendered Granada? Well, as he left the Alhambra, he reached a hill, the last one overlooking Granada before it would leave his sight. He reportedly stopped, stared at the city and Alhambra. His mother looked at him and said, Cry like a woman over what you failed to defend like a man. He settled down in the city of Fez with around 1130 uh, courtiers, 1130. A significant amount of the Gr uh, Granada population followed him, taking advantage of the Treaty of Granada which specifically let them leave. And Boabdil died around the year of uh, 1533 or 1534, we don't know exactly. Doubt was really a complicated man to understand. At times he fought with the Spanish, and at times he fought against them. He contributed to the fall of Granada and also helped to delay it. We can focus on what he did do or didn't do, you can call him a hero or a traitor, you can hate or love him, you know, if you're brainless. But at the end of the day, nothing can escape the hard truth about him. He did what he thought was best for himself and his people, even if he constantly failed to see the obvious manipulation by the northern power couple. You know, I'm, I'm kind of new at this whole historian deal, but I'm smart enough to tell you that Bob Deal most likely thought that he was the only one who could keep Granada alive. Simple as that. And with that, the Reconquista, after 700 years, was finally done. The era of al Andalus, glorious as it may have been, became a thing of the history books. As the dust settled and the Christian population celebrated, Spain rose, a Spain shaped by the Reconquista. The years of this conflict grew a very specific type of warfare in the peninsula and indeed all of Europe. A warfare that was dedicated to the complete destruction of the enemy. We can see this type of warfare throughout the Granadan War, as a lot of the civilians were outright massacred or enslaved. In all of the conquered cities, Algeciras, for example, was completely destroyed during the war. And it's with uh, this mentality that the Spanish would arrive in the Aztec Empire, and also to the Incan Empire. I don't have the, uh, time to talk about what they did there, but the leaders of the two New World Empires lived lives which were morally abhorrent to the Spanish. King Montezuma of the Aztecs was definitely killed by the Spanish when he was no longer uh, useful, and uh, the Emperor Atahualpa of the Incas was strangled to death by them. The wars the Spanish fought from the end of the Reconquista was a total war, and the prize for the Spanish was massive amounts of new land and new subjects to convert and rule over. The surrender of Granada was a shock to Europe and Islam. Europe celebrated and celebrated it, as it was seen as a counterbalance to the fall of Constantinople to the Turks, and several Catholic states congratulated the Catholic power couple of Spain. Islamic writers, obviously, had a much different reaction. They were in despair over the event. Portugal had finished its Reconquista much sooner than Spain, and yet 
it still kept attacking Morocco, conquering Ceuta, Tangiers, and many more cities in the years after that. The Reconquista itself has become a big part of both Spanish and Portuguese cultures, and to this day we can still, we can still see traces of Moorish culture all over our, our own. Half of my fucking language's words can be traced back to the Arab language. Same for the Spanish language. All the while, hundreds of buildings still dot our southern countryside from the Moorish era. Mosques built by the Almohads, towers and, and even cities. Beyond that, we both got dozens of festivals all, all over the country which celebrate the Reconquista and its events. However, we have these uh, festivals both for the Catholic perspective and the Muslim perspective of the war. The town of Merto, for example, has a uh, festival entirely dedicated to respecting its past as a Muslim town. In fact, the town's first Taifa king is a well-known and respected figure among the population to this fucking day. Portugal celebrates the conquest of towns like Évora, Lisbon or uh, the Kingdom of the Algarves because these regions are now core parts of Portugal. And yet, another can't help but co-op what the Reconquista is. Yes, we're going there, we're talking about politics. As the far right continue to rise in popularity all over Europe, Islamophobia and xenophobia continue to rise as well. I'm not gonna tell you that this is bad or that every Muslim in the world is a special little baby that can do no harm. They're not. But just like not every white person is Hitler, not every Muslim is a Saudi or a terrorist. The Reconquista, given that it's in theory a military conflict that gave rise to Spain and Portugal, is literally propaganda number one for far-right groups all over Europe. Vox, the biggest far-right group in Spain, which thankfully has uh, lost the latest elections, and Chega, one of the biggest parties in Portugal. Uh, they both used the conflict to galvanize the people. You have definitely seen hundreds of internet memes galvanizing the Crusades and sort of romanticizing the uh, Europeans who went to fight in the Holy Land. The same happens for the Reconquista. And while I do believe that the vast majority of these memes are just poking fun at the whole event, well, you know how it got knows. Uh, in the internet, if you're pretending to be an idiot, one day, genuine idiots will appear, thinking that they've found a new home. The thing about the Reconquista is that it wasn't a glorious military conflict that lasted for 700 years straight. Like many historians have pointed out, a war cannot last for 700 years. There were decades of peace and culture sharing between the Catholics and Moors. Catholics fought amongst each other. Moors also fought amongst each other, and the empires would occasionally intervene in the Reconquista to further their own goals. The Reconquista isn't special. It was a war, like any other. And if you were Portuguese, like me, or a fucking bastard Spanish, I believe that you should celebrate the Reconquista. Not because of some glorious war that drove the Moors out, but because it led to the formation of the country that you live in. If you hate Muslim culture, but love Spain or Portugal, you are actively hating a large part of the peninsula's culture. Moorish presence in Iberia is intrinsically connected to us. That is neither good nor bad, it just is. The Reconquista is important for me. I mentioned the fact that I'm Portuguese as much as a certain internet dessert mentions Du Materno or the Romans. So you can see why I'm interested in this topic. So as we say our final goodbye to this series and these events, don't let yourself think that the Catholics were inherently evil or that the Moors were savages oppressing the populace. The truth to that, as always, is muddy.
in hard to see clearly. The best thing about the Reconquista that you can do is recognize what was, what is, and move on with your life. By and by, by and by, is a better 